Can sure you did. imagine if I had made a Batman movie that didn't succeed at the box office? There now would be endless criticism. It would be a flop. Yeah, it would be considered a flop. There would be articles written, why did it flop? Uh, there would be an analysis of it. I would be criticized on the basis of the box office, and you know that. That is Joel Schumacher in 1995, shortly after the great box office success of Batman Forever, talking about what would have happened if the movie had been a disaster. And I wanted to start this video with this idea, these weirdly prophetic words, because everything that he talks about, everything that he says here, became a reality only two years later. In 1987, Warner Bros. released Batman and Robin, the fourth chapter in the cinematic Batman franchise, unaware that it was going to be the last. Batman and Robin was the biggest box office disappointment out of all the Batman movies, and naturally the studio was not happy about that. But money was not the only concern. Critics, as well as the general audiences, despised this movie. Batman and Robin has been called the worst superhero movie ever created, and it's up there in the lists of worst movies ever, period. Batman and Robin scores a 3.7 out of 10 on IMDb, with less than 16% of approval in Rotten Tomatoes, and the reputation of Batman and Robin has only gotten worse over the years, with dozens of negative articles and incredibly popular YouTube videos criticizing every single detail of the movie, farming hate for clicks and ad revenue. And I find the reaction of some middle-aged men raging online about Batman and Robin just as absurd as if they were raging about Spongebob. Now, this is not like every other video about Batman and Robin that ultimately becomes Batman and Robin is bad. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, the hate is justified, because somewhere between 1989 and 1997, the Batman movies lost something important. What made the first Batman movie great in the first place was that it took itself seriously. The concept, the idea of Batman in the real world, may be absurd, ridiculous even, but in 1989, Tim Burton and his team created a world where Batman could be very much real, taking a lot of inspiration from the then-contemporary Batman graphic novels The Dark Knight Returns and The Killing Joke. These books defined the dark, horrific, and obsessive world that Batman lived in, a world of gothic horror that was perfectly captured in the first Batman movie and which was further expanded in Batman Returns. But while the first Batman movie took the world by storm, the second one was frowned upon for being excessively dark and not appropriate for all audiences, especially not appropriate for merchandising deals. What really happened was that the studio gave Tim Burton much more creative freedom, resulting in a darker movie that made less profit at the box office. So the studio decided to take back control of their franchise, because they wanted to recapture the magic of the first Batman movie. And by magic, I mean the gargantuan amounts of money that it made. The studio removed all the people that made the first movie great, and replaced them with decent professionals of the film industry, such as director Joel Schumacher, and guided them towards a lighter kind of Batman movie, an effort that resulted in Batman Forever, a movie that I've also talked about in this video. Batman Forever is a mixed bag of confusion that somehow works, mostly thanks to the artistic vision of Joel Schumacher, and in the end the movie was more financially successful than Batman Returns, so naturally the studio executives came to the conclusion that Batman Forever was a better movie. It's at this point that Warner Bros. got greedy and started making incredibly poor choices and dumb decisions. The production of the next Batman movie was fast-tracked, immediately after Batman Forever. It all happened so fast that actor Val Kilmer, who played Batman, couldn't make arrangements to fit the movie into his schedule and he was easily replaced by George Clooney, showing that the studio didn't really care at all about who was wearing their rubber nipples. The studio once again hired Joel Schumacher as the director and gave him specific instructions to make the movie as lighter and family-friendly as he could, and although he wanted to go in the exact opposite direction, he agreed to do what was asked of him. The production team was told to make the movie more toyetic, meaning that the character designs, the batsuits, the gadgets, the vehicles, the weapons, everything had to be created with the idea that all of these things would be made into toys and merchandise. The toy companies were part of the production process, and they were even in charge of designing Mr. Freeze's weapons. Warner Bros. spent big fat paychecks to create the most elaborate sets and props, to use the best digital effects at the time, to get the most expensive actors, and all of that with the 
the idea that they were going to make so much money out of this. Loud up, come on, sing, 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 come on. Yes, come on, loud up. Warner Bros. really don't have anyone else to blame but themselves for making an unwatchable movie that has no artistic sensibility whatsoever, a Batman film that is barely about anything. I've made videos about the first three Batman movies of this franchise, and in each one of them I've managed to find some artistic vision, some theme that drives each movie, but with Batman and Robin, it's barely there. If there is any sort of theme or concept to this movie, it would be family. After all, she's family. The movie introduces Batgirl as a family member of Alfred, and she goes on to live in Sideway Manor, while Alfred's role as the father figure is developed throughout the movie with flashbacks to the moments that he shared with Bruce. Also, the plot about Alfred's disease drives home the point that Alfred is not just a servant, but an actual member of this family. And, as in every family, there has to be conflict, which is what they awkwardly try to do between Batman and Robin, creating artificial and shallow fights between them. Or at least, that's the impression we get because of how annoying these moments are. What they really tried to showcase here was the growing pains between them, which leads into their final understanding of each other. So I'm asking you, friend, partner, brother, will you trust me now? The motivations of Mr. Freeze are also driven by this concept, as everything he does is in order to save his dying wife. In the end, Freeze finds redemption when he helps Batman save Alfred, and in return Batman promises to help him save his wife. All the characters that lean into this concept of family are saved, while the characters that don't have a family are destroyed, like Bane and Poison Ivy. At least, that's my take on what this movie is really about. But unfortunately, it doesn't matter how deep or profound the themes of the movie are, or how much we analyze them, because the bottom line is that this is a bad movie with a lot of problems, such as illogical plot points that don't make any sense. Like when Batman pulls his bat streaming device so that Freeze can watch the scene of the movie where Ivy confesses to killing his wife. Or how the heroes suddenly decide to get new costumes for the final fight without any explanation other than they needed to sell more toys. I think Chris O'Donnell said it best when he described the experience of making this movie more like making a toy commercial. And they were not even trying to hide it. That's why every Poison Ivy action figure comes complete with him! But making a movie to sell toys is not a problem. Just look at Toy Story, a franchise designed to sell toys. The first movie came out in 1995, and I really think Warner wanted to replicate their success, without understanding that, even though a movie is designed to sell toys, it still needs to be good and have good stories and good characters. One of the crucial elements that led to the success of the previous Batman movies was the attention to the characterization of each villain. While they were not exactly faithful to their comic book counterparts, they were still interesting variations with their own psychological twist. But the villains of Batman and Robin are shallow parodies of themselves. For the character of Mr. Freeze, they try to make an adaptation of the character from Batman the Animated Series. And I use the word adaptation very loosely here, because the idea of a tragic scientist who lost his wife to an incurable disease and then lost his humanity trying to save her is flawless in the animated series, but it just doesn't work in Batman and Robin, and it's because of the inconsistent characterization of Freeze. He is supposed to be a tragic figure, so how come he is constantly cracking all sorts of terrible ice-related puns, cool party. wearing cute slippers, conducting singing sessions in his hideout, and also smoking a cigar? How is that even possible? Wouldn't the heat of that cigar kill him from the inside? And yet, the movie wants us to feel sorry for him and his wife. <laughs> it's, it's not possible. You lie! And then there's Poison Ivy, the second female villain of the franchise. She is a nerdy and shy girl in the beginning, just like Selina Kyle was in Batman Returns. But Pamela Eilly becomes a villain when a man kills her and she is somehow reborn with supernatural abilities, exactly like Catwoman in Batman Returns. Okay, so the origin of Poison Ivy might not be original, but then she goes to Gotham City and forces a meeting with Bruce Wayne, where she tries to sell him this insane plan that would risk millions of humans and Bruce flat out rejects her, exactly like what happened to Edward Nigma in Batman Forever, god damn it. Okay, let's face it, 
Ivy's not original, and her plan doesn't make any sense. But hey, at least she looks almost like in the comics, right? Right? Poison Ivy and Mr. Freeze are problematic, but Bane was literally the biggest disappointment. In the comics, Bane is a phenomenal character, a criminal genius who turns himself into the most dangerous threat that Batman has ever encountered, an intellectual and physical equal who actually defeated Batman, was reduced to this. Enough monkey business. We've got work to do. <sighs> monkey work. It is for that and many other reasons that people rightfully hate this movie. It's understandable. I don't particularly like it either. But I'm not going to say it's the worst the movie ever made. Because in 1987, I was six years old. And this was one of my favorite movies back then. Look, if you were a teenager or an adult Batman fan when the movie came out and you expected something similar to the previous films or the comics, you have the right to hate Batman and Robin, because it betrayed all your expectations. And if you're someone who wasn't even born when the movie came out, then you have grown in the era of excellent comic book movies, and you can also dislike Batman and Robin because it's something that will never live up to your expectations. But for those of us who watched and enjoyed this movie as kids, who played with all the toys that came out based on this movie, who collected the merchandise, the trading cards, the coloring books, the puzzles, we shouldn't hate this movie because it was there for us. I'm not sure if I would still be a Batman fan if it wasn't for this movie keeping the passion for Batman alive back when I was a small kid. And we also shouldn't hate it, because it's not intentionally bad. The hundreds of creative people who worked on this movie didn't want to make a bad movie. Nobody wants to make a bad movie. Things were just out of their control and into the hands of mindless and greedy Hollywood executives who didn't understand or care about the source material. In retrospect, Batman and Robin was a blessing in disguise, because after this disaster, the superhero movies decided to take the source material seriously, and Batman and Robin became a cautionary tale of how bad things can go when you don't care about these characters and you only care about the money. I for once am grateful for Batman and Robin, because without its colossal failure, we would never have gotten the Dark Knight trilogy. Batman and Robin is a movie with too many problems, but the biggest one is that it's a regression. The movie undid all the previous work done by Tim Burton and many other talented people that wanted to take Batman into his most dark version. Instead, this movie deliberately takes a look at the lighter side of Batman, and in doing so, it inevitably takes us back to the Silver Age of comics, where Batman and Robin are public figures, authorities admired by the general population, mask crusaders that actually go ice skating as part of their crime-fighting adventures to fight colorful villains that announce their evil plan in long monologues. Batman and Robin is a throwback to the old Batman days of the Silver Age and becomes a modern version of the 60s TV show. Even the creators of the comic book adaptation of the movie knew this. This comic gets rid of a lot of the movie's problems, but they also name drop Aunt Harriet, one of the most obscure members of the Batman family in the 1960s. This is a deep cut reference that only works because it reinforces the concept of family that existed in that era of Batman. That Batman was wild, colorful, over the top and aimed towards little kids, which is exactly how we could describe Batman and Robin. And I genuinely think there's nothing wrong with it. George Clooney is closer to Adam West because these versions don't focus on the dark and obsessive side of Batman, which is completely fine. There's a reason why people still like the 1960s Batman TV show, and that's because Batman is a flexible character who can be both dark and bright, serious and goofy, and they're all valid interpretations. The problem is that each of these versions have their own time and place in history, and unfortunately, Batman and Robin came out in the wrong time and place. I can absolutely imagine how Joel Schumacher and the rest of his team felt when the movie came out and the non-stop criticism and hate started. As I said before, nobody wants to make a bad movie. Nobody wants to create bad things. I would feel awful if my old videos got shit on constantly because they are not good videos. I never wanted to make bad videos. But that was the best I could do back then. I'm a much better video creator now. And thanks to Batman and Robin, of all things, I have become inspired to make a new version of the history of Batman in the Silver Age, a new documentary showcasing the amazingly weird history of Batman in his most complicated era, and finally create the proper continuation to my video about Batman in the Golden Age. 
And on that note, I would like to thank those of you who have been with me since the beginning, because you've seen me grow and evolve as a creator. And a special thanks to my Patreons and channel members for believing in me, because without you, I probably wouldn't be here anymore. So thanks again to all of you for watching this video, and hopefully I will see you all in the next one. The bad credit card is still fucking dumb, though.